Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be back. We had a fun vacation. We went camping uh, last week, caught a few fish, so that was, I'm satisfied. <laughs> I prayed a lot. Lord, please help me catch something. Usually, I, I, I show off and show a picture up there, but I didn't, I didn't get a chance to <laughs> put it up there. But anyway, so praise God, we are going through our, our series our, on the seven churches of revelations to him who loves us. We started with the revelation of Jesus Christ, talking about his love for us. We said that love is the most powerful motivator in the world, that moms would throw themselves under cars to save their, their children. And so we said that the tone is love when you hear the message to the letters in, to the churches. And verse 5 begins with, To him who loves us and has freed us from the, our sins by his blood. How do we know Jesus loves us? Well, we, look, we look to the cross. And we end with today, the Revelation 3.19, the letter to Laodicea, with those whom I love. So the, the message is love. The tone is love. Why is that important? Because every letter says, Repent. And what is it that causes us to repent? Only one thing. It is the kindness of God that's meant to lead us to repentance. The kindness and goodness of God is what melts our knees so that we surrender, we bow down to the Lord. Uh, we looked at the first and the last. We said that a bigger, brighter view of Jesus Christ makes you understand that it will be all worth it at the end. You know, just like my trip to Mount Haleakala and seeing that beautiful sunrise. To the church of Ephesus, we asked... Why do you do what you do? It's a church that lost its first love. So you can blame circumstances, but backsliding always begins in the heart. We looked at the church of Smyrna. Pastor Al spoke on it. We said that we need to focus on Jesus Christ. When my, my wife gave birth, he says to, to overcome the pain, you must have a focal point. You know, we took Lamas. Of course, once the actual birth pain started, that all went out the window. <laughs> Give us the drugs. <laughs> the church of Pergamum says we need to avoid compromise with the world by focusing on the blessings of Jesus Christ. Why, is, why should we avoid compromise? There were some in the church who, who were following the teachings of Balaam and some who were teaching the, the teachings of the Nicolaitans because compromise is like cancer. And so we need to get rid of it. To the church of Thyatira, we need to avoid evil by holding on to the promise of Jesus Christ. I told you the story about when I was a little boy, I saw the members of Jim Jones in the school that I went to. Um, I went in the Fillmore District. I went to Raphael Will um, Elementary School. But years later, I didn't know that over 900 people would die because they, they drank Kool-Aid. And here to the church in Thyatira, Jesus is saying there's poison in the pews. And so don't drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, don't drink the Kool-Aid. You see people drinking the Kool-Aid uh, or selling Kool-Aid, tell them to stop. You see people about to drink Kool-Aid, tell them, don't, don't do it. And so it's important to know right doctrine because wrong doctrine is like poison. Uh, the church in Sardis, we need to guard against dead spirituality. You could look beautiful on the outside like the Taj Mahal and have dead bones inside. And so what he's saying is make sure that your reputation matches your reality. That you don't just have a good reputation, that you're actually uh, walking with the Lord. To the Church of Philadelphia, Pastor Eric spoke, and he did a good job, and he, he used the little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, and, and really with Christians, it's in him we can, in him we can, in him we can. This afternoon, we want to look at the Church of Laodicea, found in Revelations 3.14. Before we do that, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth, to be reminded of your love, to be reminded of your commitment to us. Uh, we thank you for the reminder that it is when we bend our knees, it's when we go down that we're able to go up. And we're able to fellowship with you and see things from a different perspective. So I ask that your spirit would once again speak to each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of things I like eating or drinking. One of it is soup. I like all kinds of soup. Chinese soup, uh, Italian soup, uh, French soup. 
you know, I'll eat, I'll eat clam chowder, I'll eat uh, ramen. Of course, I like sinigang, best of all, uh, Filipino soup. But whenever you, I, I eat soup, there's one requirement. I, I want to make sure that it's hot. Uh, in fact, while I'm eating sinigang and it, it starts to get cold, I'll put it in the microwave again so that it could get hot. And you need to do that with sinigang because all the fat begins to rise to the top and you need to microwave it again. And I also like coffee. I like black coffee. And um, I, I, I just sip it. And so while I'm studying, I'm sipping coffee. When it gets cold, I go to the microwave also and I, I, I heat it up. Uh, in fact, if you go to my office, it's funny. Somebody gave me a plate, a hot plate, just for the cup so that it'll stay uh, hot longer. But even then, sometimes it'll, it'll go below the temperature that I like, and so I go into B's office, and I, I use the microwave, and I, I drink it hot. I like soup hot. I like coffee hot. When it comes to the temper of the church, temperature of the church, Jesus has a preference. He says in verse 15, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus doesn't want the church to be lukewarm. The sad part in this letter is that the church in Laodicea actually thought they were hot. In fact, in verse 17, it says, for you say. In other words, this is what they thought about themselves. It says, not realizing. For you say not realizing. The church thought that they were all that, they, but they were ignorant of their condition. They thought that they were passing with flying colors when in reality, they were about to be dropped out of school. When Jesus evaluates a church, he's always on point. In other words, he is totally accurate in his assessment. We can fool others, we can fool ourselves, we can't fool Jesus. He knows what we are like. He knows our spiritual temperature. And so if I were to ask you, what about you? If Jesus were to take the temperature of your spiritual condition, what would it be? If Jesus were to take the, spirit, the temperature of Faith Bible Church of Vallejo, will he find us lukewarm? Do you think you're doing better in your spiritual life than you actually are? In other words, like one of the churches where they had a reputation, but he says, actually, you're dead. Do we have, does our reality match our re reputation? Are we lukewarm like the church of Laodicea? Where's the church of Laodicea? The church of Laodicea is about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia, Pastor Eric's message last week. It is mentioned in the letter to the to Colossae in Colossians chapter 4, 13. For I bear him, talking about Epaphras, witness that he has worked hard for you and those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. So Laodicea is our church today. It was mentioned in, in the letter to the Colossians. And Epaphras was probably a pastor of the church of Laodicea at some point. Those three cities are part of... Um, Three churches that, or have three churches that are in the Lycus River Valley. Colossae is about 10 miles south of, La south of Laodicea. Hierapolis is about five miles northwest of Laodicea. So Hierapolis is a city that's known for its hot springs. Um, today it is called Pamukkale, which means cotton mountains. If you were to look at Hierapolis from a distance, their mountains, it looks like snow, but it's actually mineral deposits. Laodicea, or Colossae, is right up against mountain ranges that goes up 6,000 feet high. And they had a lot of fresh, cold water. Uh, Hierapolis, hot water. Colossae, fresh, cold water. And we'll talk about why that's important later on. Laodicea is a city that was very rich. 35 years before John wrote, it was a city that was devastated by earthquake as, as well as many of the cities surrounding it. And what's, what's interesting about Laodicea is this. All the cities asked help from Rome. They needed money to rebuild, except 
for Laodicea. It was so rich that it did not want, it was too proud to ask for any, any help, any assistance from the government. It was able to build the city on its own resources. That's how rich it was. Laodicea is also known for its black wool. They raised black sheep in their hills, and their wool was known all over the world. They were able to make cloth that is not only soft, but shiny. So they exported that all over the world. Another thing that Laodicea is known for is a medicine called Phrygian powder that heals the eyes. It's like an eye ointment for whatever ails the eyes. And all those things will come into play as we interpret this passage. So all those things Laodicea had, uh, very rich, but it did not have a good source of water. So it was easily conquered. And so Jesus introduces himself to this city, and it was one of two churches that didn't have any commendation. Jesus just introduces himself, and he goes straight into rebuking them. But Jesus, the way Jesus introduces himself is actually an encouragement. Notice how he introduces himself. He says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. One of the things that we learn about the Lord Jesus Christ is that he is faithful even when the church is unfaithful. The Bible says that he remains, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. And so he says, he is the amen to the angel of the church in Laodicea. As we know, the word angel means messenger. It could mean to the the pastor of that church. The words of the amen. You ever go to churches where they say amen? Yes? What does the amen mean? Hmm? So be it. It is an affirmation that what the person is saying is true. And Jesus is that the affirmation of God. And Jesus is also sovereign over the church. When he says he is the amen, it means that he is in control of the church, even when the church seems out of control. And then he says, the words of the amen, the faithful and true. He is faithful, and not only is he faithful, what he says about the church is, is accurate. His assessment is correct. He's on point. He doesn't miss when he gives a grade. He's very accurate. When he grades the church. And then he says he is the beginning of God's creation. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that he was created first. If you uh, ask a, a Jehovah's Witness, he would say, see, that means that he was the first one created. No. The word beginning, RK, is actually active. It means a better way of translating it is he is the beginner. He is the source of all creation, including the church. And therefore, he has the right to evaluate the church, and he has the right to tell it what to do to get itself right. The way of Christ. He's faithful even when we are unfaithful. So he gives a warning, three warnings that he gives to this church. The first warning is, don't be lukewarm. He says in verse 15, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you are either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, what is the interpretation of cold and hot? Because when I was growing up, the interpretation that I heard is hot is godly and cold is ungodly. Or hot is, you know, in the church and cold is in the world. And Jesus is saying, don't be both. You know, don't, don't. Don't be both in the world and, and out of the world and lukewarm. Be, you know, I, I, want, you to, I want you to be hot or cold. Um, I want you to, to either be on fire for me or, or totally against me. And that bothered me. I don't know about you. If you've heard that interpret, that bothered me. Because why would Jesus want you to be, to be far from him? Why would Jesus want you to be, to be away from him? You know, and it didn't sit well with me. And so... As you, as you begin to understand the historical context, the interpretation actually begins to come through. And I think what he's saying is this. Jesus wants us useful. Whenever you, you drink something, you either want it hot or cold, don't you? You want coffee hot and you want Pepsi cold. 
You don't want Pepsi tepid. You don't want Pepsi hot or warm. You want it cold. You want ice on it. You want it in the refrigerator. And so what Jesus is saying is this. I want you useful to me. Um, This is Paige Patterson in his commentary. And this is what he says. I wish that you were either a fresh, life-giving drink of cold water or else a healing hot mineral bath. But because you are neither refreshing and life-giving nor healing, you are simply disgusting, and I will spew you out of my mouth. And so that's what he's saying. What Jesus is saying is, I wish you were a blessing to me. But what you're doing is repulsive and makes me sick. This church was mired in mediocrity. They were comfortable in their complacency. They were so-so, and they thought they were successful. In other words, they thought they were hot, and they were not. And so Jesus was saying, I want you useful. I want you cold or hot. I want you something that's refreshing or healing, not lukewarm. And this would have resonated with the church in Laodicea because the water they received was from Hierapolis. In spite of its wealth, Laodicea didn't have its own source of water. So they would pipe in through aqueducts, and they've actually uncovered this, they'd pipe in hot mineral water from Hierapolis, which is up north, and that hot water, by the time it got to Laodicea, would be lukewarm, and it had a lot of minerals. And so according to, if you read Swindoll, he says, actually, the water was so bad that visitors who were not used to the water, when they drank it, they would actually throw up. That's how bad the water was. And so when Jesus says, I don't want you lukewarm, they knew that that was, you know, that's what he was referring to. But what is lukewarmness? What is, so that's the historical context. What is lukewarmness? So hot and cold, I want you useful. You know, like hot coffee or, or Pepsi, ice cold Pepsi. What is lukewarmness? Lukewarmness is a spirit of self-sufficiency that pushes the Savior out the door of our lives. Let me say that again. Lukewarmness is a spirit of self-sufficiency. In other words, I don't need Jesus in my life. And pushes the Savior, squeezes him out of our day-to-day activity and ministry. To put it simply, it's pride. It's thinking that we could accomplish spiritual deeds through earthly means. John, the same author of Revelations, the book of John, Gospel of John, says this in John 15, verse 5. Let's read it together. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So from apart, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. We read that, but we don't think that. Because in our minds, apart from me, I can do some things. Apart from Jesus, I could do a few things. In the case of the Laodicean, apart from Christ, we can do everything. And so Jesus says, no, that's lukewarmness. To try to do church without me is disgusting. And so he says, stop being lukewarm. And then the second warning is, realize your spiritual condition. It says in verse 17, for you say, they think, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. In other words, I don't need Jesus. Not realizing. So they say they thought they were all that. They thought they were rich. It says, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So this is exactly the opposite of Smyrna. Remember Smyrna? They were poor materially, but they were rich spiritually. In this case, they were rich materially. They could afford all kinds of things. But Jesus says, because of your material wealth, You have stopped depending on me, 
and you are poor spiritually, what would you rather be? Rich materially or rich spiritually? Somebody says, I want both, Pastor. (laughs) But sometimes the temptation is when we're rich materially, it is to depend on ourselves, to be self-made men. And so I don't need, I don't need anything. And so here Jesus begins to criticize them and he hits them right between the eyes. He throws major shade at them. He, he criticizes precisely with what they were proud of. And so he begins by saying, first of all, you are wretched. You are like a country that's been overworn, uh, overrun by by war, it's war torn, it is, it is devastated. You're wretched. So it's not realizing that you are pitiable. They thought that they were to be praised. If they were assessing themselves, hey, we're, we're a good church, and Jesus is saying, No, you're not. You're to be pitied, not to be praised. And then the three things they were most proud about, Jesus begins to use it as analogies for their spiritual condition. He says, First of all, you are poor. You're poor. They were proud of being rich. We don't need government assistance. And Jesus says, you are poor. Secondly, he says, you are blind. What were they known for? Medicine that healed the eyes. Phrygian powder. He says, you you help people all over the world see physically, but spiritually, you're blind. And the third thing they were proud of was what? Their black wool. The, the shiny, soft wool that they imported, exported all over the world. It says, you clothe people all over the world, but you're naked. You're an embarrassment. You're to be pitied. And so Jesus says, stop being lukewarm. Realize your spiritual condition. Then he says, find spiritual success in me. Find success in me. Find your resources in me, they were too proud to rely on the emperor. They were too proud in the church to rely on the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever pride enters a church, it becomes useless to God. And so the way to apply this message, Jesus is saying, is buy from me. The operative word is me. Buy from me gold refined by fire. So you're poor. Spiritually, find gold in me. Find riches from me. And it's not just any gold. It's the 24 karat kind. It's the pure kind. He says it is refined by fire. In 1 Peter 1.7, it speaks of our faith being refined by fire. It speaks of our faith being like gold. It says, so that The tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the result in the praise and glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. One of the problems we have when when materially all our needs are met is we stop trusting God. The Bible says it is the poor people in this world that are rich in faith. And so Jesus is going to this church that had everything materially and says, you need to trust me. You need to find your faith in me and not on your resources. And it needs to be faith that's tested by fire. You know, we, we all like to be comfortable. But one of the dangers of being comfortable is that it weakens our faith. We no longer pray the way we we, we, we should. We no, no longer spend time on our knees. Why? Because every, we have everything. And so he says, find riches in me. Secondly, he says, find for me white garments. So totally the opposite from the black wool, right, in color. But he says, you pride yourself in clothing people. Find your clothing for me. And that clothing refers to holiness and righteousness. That when we depend on ourselves, The fragrance that comes out of us is no longer pleasing to God. It's no longer the righteousness of Christ. It becomes our own righteousness, and that stinks to God. Our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. And so he says, find your righteousness, your clothing from me. Next week, we'll talk about Revelations 19.8. It's the marriage of the Lamb. So everything that we've been talking about is marriage preparation. 
And so it says in, in verse 8, let me just give you a preview. It was granted to her to clothe herself with linen bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteousness deed. Righteous deeds of the saints. But what I want to see is show you is that it was granted to her. In some translation, it was given to her. When Jesus says, buy from me, you can't afford it. The only way that you could receive it from Jesus is to have faith in him. That he's the one that gives it to you. He's the one that gives you gold faith. He's the one that gives you white garment. And then he's the one that gives you the ability to see, the ability to discern, the ability to have a vision for your church and for your family, for your business. It says, and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Again, they were proud of, of this medicine, Phrygian powder. It says, you're spiritually blind. You need to buy from me. You need to get from me. This ointment, spiritual ointment, so that you could see because you're blind. That when we depend on ourselves, what happens is we begin to run into trouble because we depend on our own wisdom, on our own direction. And we don't see. We're blind. And so he says, find your resources for me. Dr. Daniel um, Aiken says, regularly, daily, we need to ask the Lord in prayer and by the word, show me my true spiritual condition. Reveal to me my spiritual blind spots and areas of sin where I no longer see. Help me, Lord, to see myself as you see me. That's so all Jesus is saying. Realize your spiritual condition and buy from me. I am the one that is the key to spiritual success. Now, we, whenever we hear this message, and I've already alluded to, to making sure spiritual success is, is from the Lord, but a lot of times I would hear preachers and the focus would be on getting out of being lukewarm. You have to be hot for the Lord. And if, if that's what you hear from me this afternoon, that's not the message of this passage. Because it, if you go away from this, this service and, and you're going, I'm going to do better. I'm going to be hotter. I'm going to be useful. You're going to be frustrated. In other words, let me give you this illustration. If I'm drinking coffee and all of a sudden it starts getting cold, what do you think would happen if I started yelling at the cup? I don't like you that way. You need to be hotter. You can't be lukewarm. What will the coffee cup say to me? I can't do anything. I'm just a coffee cup, right? What needs to happen for that coffee to get hotter? Ah, it needs a pot of fresh coffee. Something needs to be poured in there for it to get hotter. And that's really what, what, what Jesus is saying here. The message is not be more committed to Christ. The message is to be connected to Christ. Because it's only Christ entering yours, your heart. It's only Christ entering your life that will give you the spiritual hotness that Jesus is talking about. You can't produce it on your own. And so it is actually an invitation to receive the warmth from the Lord Jesus Christ that he offers. What does Jesus offer? What is he saying in this passage? How could we become hotter for the Lord? Not by trying harder. It is by being connected to the one who loves us. In verse 19, it says, Those whom I love. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. What is it that gives us the energy, the motivation to repent? It's understanding that Jesus loves us. It is that love that melts our knees so that we bend down and we bow down to God, that we, we acknowledge his lordship in our, in our lives. It is not by trying harder. It is by being connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what uh, Timothy Keller says. He says, we are more sinful, you are more sinful than you dare imagine, and you are more loved and accepted than you could dare hope. 
you are more sinful than you could dare imagine. In other words, we're worse than we think we are. Some of us, you're hearing this message, you go, yeah, pastor, I'm hot. No, no, you're not. Neither am I. There are always areas in our lives where it's lukewarm. We are worse than we think we are. We're more sinful than we think we are. But here's the good news. What's the good news? We are more loved and accepted than we could ever dare hope. That the tone is love, that even though Jesus, this is the harshest word so far. I mean, this is harsher than those people who were, who were committing idolatry and immorality and heresy and, and you know, spirit of Jezebel. Those, those rebukes were actually milder than this. I spit you out. I mean, that's really, that's really harsh. But really, the tone is love. That the Jesus was harsh, not because he hated them, but because he loved them. And it was just, Jesus was putting his arms around them and, and saying, you know, I'm saying this to you because I love you. I visited the, the youth camp um, Thursday, and I watched their skits. I watched all the skits of all the kids at youth camp. And there was one phrase that was repeated over and over again in all the skits that Pastor Ed shared with them. He was talking about the life of Daniel and their... their um, theme was resolved. But the, the, the phrase that was repeated over and over is that God's re- resolve to love you is ridiculous. God's resolve to love you is ridiculous. In other words, the hero in Daniel is not Daniel. It is God. It's because God loved Daniel that he was able to do all those great things in the book of Daniel. And so here In this passage, Jesus is reminding us that he loves us. He loves us. He loves us while we didn't want to have anything to do with him. Now the Bible says, for God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. He loves us when when, when we're running away from him. The story of the prodigal son, it says that while he was still far off, after he had spent all the money of his father, after he had lived a life that was, that was sinful, he says, while he was still afar off, what does that mean? It means the father every day would go up to a high vantage point so he could see the first sign of his son coming back. And as soon as his son went over the horizon, the father ran to him. The father never stopped loving the son. He loves us while we were sinners. He loves us while we we're running away from him. He loves us while when we're too busy to spend time with him. Because we're, we're doing things for the family, doing things for our work. We're doing you know, our hobbies. He loves us when, when we're too busy and, and have squeezed them out of our lives. He loves us when we're lukewarm and proud thinking that we don't need him. This is Jesus who's speaking, the one who loves us in spite of our sinfulness. His resolve to love us is ridiculous. And it is that love that causes us to repent. It is that love that that causes us to, to open our hearts and say, Jesus, I want you back in my life. And that's exactly what he says in verse 20. And many times we use this as an evangelistic message or an evangelistic verse, but really is speaking to Christians. It says, behold, let's read it together. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Allow Jesus back into your life. Know that he loves you. Allow him back into your life. Why? Because the key to fervent commitment is fellowship with Christ. The key to fervent commitment is fellowship with Christ. You want to be hot for the Lord, then you need to spend time with him. It is time spent with the Savior that keeps us on fire. It is time spent with the Savior that enriches our faith. It is time spent with the Savior that clothes us with holiness. It is time spent with the Savior that gives us a new vision for our ministry. Gives us a new vision for our family. Gives us a new vision for our our jobs and for our businesses. It is time spent with Jesus. The key to fervent 
Commitment is fellowship with Christ. I love what Paige Patterson says. He says, the question to be answered is always the relationship of Christ to the local church. Is he on the inside embraced, loved, honored, enthroned, and followed? Or is he on the outside knocking and calling for the entrance to the entity that bears his name? Jesus and in the inside of your life or outside? Is Jesus in the inside of Faith Bible Church of Vallejo or outside knocking? Where is Jesus in your life? And so he says, know that Jesus loves you. Allow Jesus back into your life. Third, experience victory and rest in Jesus Christ. It says in verse 30, 21, to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my, ha- on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus is saying, experience victory by trusting me. The one who overcomes, the one who's victorious, is the one who trusts Jesus. The one who has faith in Jesus. The one who depends on Jesus and not on his own resources. And he says, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. That when we are fellowshipping with Jesus, the dining room becomes the throne room. He says this fellowship will result in you finding rest. You know, one of the reasons we get burned out in ministry is because we rely on our own resources. We become successful and we begin to think, oh yeah, it's, it's good planning, it's... It's knowing, having SOPs and, and doing publicity and having the technology and, and doing all this that will make us successful. And we begin to rely on, on ourselves until we hit a problem that is greater than our resources. And then we begin to panic. We, get, we begin to get burned out. We begin to get stressed. Why? Because we're relying on our own selves. And so the, the message is always... Rely on me, and I will give you not only victory, I will give you rest. You could have longevity in the ministry. I've been a pastor of this church for 27 years. Not because of anything in me, but because of God's grace. Apart from him, I would have burned out a long time ago. So he says, you need to rely on me. You need to spend time with me. The key to fervent commitment is fellowship with Christ. Then he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Don't just let it go in one ear and out the other. As you hear it, as you hear Jesus knocking, let him in. Let him in. The way of Jesus, faithful even when we're faithless. The warning of Jesus, stop being lukewarm. The warmth of Jesus, I love you. I love you even when you're lukewarm. So let me in because I miss you. Jesus lovingly calls me to himself and offers me his resources so I can be useful for his glory. Jesus lovingly calls me to himself. It is a loving call. If you feel convicted, it is Jesus speaking to you out of a heart of love. And he offers you his resources. He offers you his fellowship. He says, let me into your life so that I can be useful for his glory. He says, I want to use you. I want you to be useful. I don't want you lukewarm. I want you either hot or cold. I want you to be refreshing or or healing to the people that that, that you encounter. Because I don't want you lukewarm. I don't want you being self-sufficient. I don't want you trying to do things on your own, being too proud for my help. He says, you need me. It's only in me that you find hotness or coldness that refreshes or that heals people. Let me end with this story. When, When I was growing up, I used to see this picture all the time. In fact, I worked at Western Christian Bookstore, and we would sell this this painting. 
I didn't think anything of it until I realized that there's something different about this door. This door doesn't have a doorknob. And it wasn't forgotten by the, by the painter. He did it on purpose. Because his point is this. Jesus is the creator of the universe. He created the church. He created you and me. And yet with all that power, he doesn't force himself into your life. He simply knocks. And he waits for you to open the door from the inside. Have you opened the door? Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed today, if you've, come, if you've come and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then that knock is a knock for salvation. He wants to save you. The Bible says, For as many as believed him, to those who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. And so if you would ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, ask him into your life, the Bible says he will save you. And so if that's the desire of your heart, if you're, if you're new to this, this church, if you've, you've come for the first time and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come to him right now. In the quietness of this moment, I invite you to open the door of your heart. Just quietly where you're at, just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I hear and now open the door of my heart. I receive you into my life. That's my Lord and Savior. I put my faith and trust in you alone to save me. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, thank you for anyone who prayed that prayer. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their faith. Maybe you are a believer. Maybe you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, your life, at one time in your, in your teenage years, in your young adult years. But somehow, some way, you have slowly but surely edged him out. You have not been spending time with him. You have not been fellowshipping with him. Realize that he loves you. He loves you even when you're lukewarm. And he wants, he wants to spend time with you. And it is, that, it is that warmth, it is that kindness, that goodness that just makes us want to rush to the door and, and, and fling it open so that he could come in. And if that's your desire right now, would you just do business with God? Just say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me for thinking that I could do things without you. For edging you out of my life. For being self-sufficient. Lord, give me the gold that you promise. And the white garment. And the ointment so that I could see. Help me to spend time in fellowship with you once more. Come back to my life and, and, and fellowship with me the way that we used to. Father, I thank you for the prayers of your children. And, and you know each heart, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you, through your gentle way, through your spirit, would speak to each heart. And that we would have a deeper, more intimate relationship with the one who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.